to the holiday edition of HR Hot Topics. I'm your host, Jody Schaefer, and my aim is to make this the most informative five to 10 minutes of your month. You know it's not gonna be five, especially this month, because we are looking ahead to what the next calendar year might bring and how those kinds of changes might affect you as an employer. And one of the biggest things that we need to talk about are the election results from November. So for the first time in 40 years, Michigan will have a democratically controlled House, Senate, governor's seat, attorney general, secretary of state. There's probably more, this isn't my lane. But, you know, you kind of get the feel here. Slim majority. So in the House, Dems have control 56-54. In the Senate, 20 to 18. So slim majorities. Um, there's going to have to be a lot of compromise to get things done. I don't expect sweeping changes, but I did want to share with you some of the topics that I'm hearing uh, come up in some of the p political and policy circles that that I sit in, and there aren't a lot of those, by the way. That's not really my cup of tea, but you know, I'm always sort of listening for tidbits that I think are gonna affect my clients. And one of the ones that came up had to do with non-compete. So there seems to be a lot of talk around whether or not um, this new legislature looks favorably on non-competes as they're currently written in the state of Michigan. And the thought is that those will probably come under scrutiny going forward. So if you're using non-competes right now, there may be some changes that come out of the legislature around how those have to be worded. So you just want to plant that seed. Another one, an obvious one, I think, um, that Dems are looking to repeal the right to work law. Um, I don't know how much of an impact that will actually have on employers because it doesn't affect a union's ability to organize or to bargain. It really is focused on whether or not employees have to pay union dues in a union shop. That right now, with right to work, that's an employee choice. Um, but there is some concern about if right to work is repealed, how attractive will the state of Michigan be for um, outside businesses coming in? So. We'll see what happens with that. But the big one, the one I was really keying in on, was discussion around an increase to the unemployment insurance benefits. Right now in the state of Michigan, our weekly benefit amount to an unemployed worker, the maximum benefit amount is $362. We all know that is woefully short. I mean, I don't think that you could buy groceries for $362 right now with the price of bread. Um, that dollar amount has not been increased since 2002. So I think there's, there's agreement on both sides of the aisle that that, that has to be looked at. Just for a, a point of reference, Michigan currently has the lowest unemployment uh, benefit in the Midwest, and we also have the least number of weeks of eligibility currently at 20 in the Midwest. So I think there's um, some agreement that that needs to be looked at, but the concern is that the unemployment insurance fund, which is 100% employer funded, was decimated at the end of COVID, and Michigan had one of the best funds in the country pre-COVID. We worked really, really hard to build that up, and then COVID wiped it down to almost zero. So we didn't go negative, but you know it was still um, it was touch and go there for a bit, right? And we're climbing our way back out of it, albeit very slowly. And so there is some concern over timing. If we increase benefits, how much should we increase them? How much can the fund actually? Um, you know, support. So the solvency piece will be a question. So just, you know, kind of keep your eyes and ears open for discussion on that, because as I said, it's employer funded. So if we raise rates, we are also going to be paying more. So I wanted to put that on your radar because January for many of you is when you start your new budget cycle. On the topic of budgets, another thing that I think you need to be budgeting for right now is the expansion of paid sick leave and potentially the increase to minimum wage depending on the wages that you're paying your staff. Um, if you'll recall, both of those issues were ballot proposals in 2018. The legislature adopted both issues outright and then amended them in the same legislative session to try to make them more workable for employers. And on the paid sick leave side, one of those amendments was to carve out small employers, those with 50 employees or less, from having to participate in paid sick leave at all. So for many of you watching this, um, if you offer paid sick leave, it's because you choose to do so as a competitive benefit, not because you are mandated to do so by the state. 
Well, there was a challenge to whether or not the legislature had the constitutional authority to amend an appeal, right, or excuse me, amend in the same legislative session. It's called adopt and amend uh, in the same legislative session. And so it's gone through a series of court cases. The one that I came to you about in July was um, a court of claims ruling that basically said the legislature did not have constitutional authority to do what it did and therefore um, the Paid Sick Leave Act as it was written in 2018 and the increased minimum wage as it was written in 2018 had to go back into effect. And that was a huge shock for a lot of employers because minimum wage, not so much, right? Many of you were paying above that anyway because of market conditions. But the minimum wage bill had an elimination of the tip credit, which is huge for people working in hospitality. And the paid sick leave applied to all employers regardless of size. So that was going to be a real financial hit um, and a change to policy that we had never seen before. So both sides, you know, kind of realized that this was going to be traumatic for employers. The judge who issued the ruling actually then issued a stay on their own ruling, which is basically the pause button and said, this doesn't have to go into effect until February 19th, 2023. Well, here we sit in December and February is not that far away, folks. Now, as soon as this case came out, there was an appeal immediately. And we've been waiting to see when that appeal was going to be heard. Um, and the, I have some updates on that, so I just want to share that. The Court of Appeals case is scheduled for uh, December 13th, which is actually the day that this episode is airing. So today, folks, this is when the Court of Appeals case is being heard. Uh, we won't get a judgment today. Expectations are that we will probably hear something out of this case end of December, early January. We're waiting to see. So if Court of Appeals sides with the legislature, then this February 19th date sort of goes away, right? But if the Court of Appeals doesn't side with the legislature, in other words, if they hold up the Court of Claims ruling and says, nope, they're right, legislature didn't have the authority to do that, then that February 19th date becomes a reality for all of us. So I, I don't know. I, I'm not feeling a lot of optimism that Court of Appeals is going to rule in favor of the legislature. So I think the best bet if you're an employer listening to this, and again, if it's budgeting season for you, I think you need to budget as though come February 19th, you're going to be required to offer paid sick leave to all employees. And there are a lot of other pieces to that original legislation that I'm not touching on today because I promised you five to 10 minutes, uh, not 15 to 20. So I will put that language in the links in the email so you can read it. I also have a comparison chart so you can see how the amended law compares to the original law um, and, and some other resources to help you with that. But I think we need to be planning as though this February 19th date is a reality for us. Um, you can assume, regardless of who wins here, this case will most likely be appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. There's some, you know, people seem to think that um, the Supreme Court will probably decide to hear the case just because of the precedent setting nature of this. Uh, but even if the Supreme Court hears that it, it's not going to be before February 19th. So, you know, we're just kind of waiting to see. Now, there was a conversation that was had with LEO, which is the Labor um, and Economic Opportunity Department at the state, which would be the, the enforcement agency, so to speak, for this paid sick leave law. Um, in that conversation, LEO recognized that employers would need a ramp up period in order to become compliant. Now, how long that ramp up period is, is it 60 days, 90 days, 120 days? Who knows, right? But one thing to keep in mind here, the original legislation offered employees a private right of action if they felt like their rights had been violated. So even if Leo, as an enforcement agency, says, OK, employers, we know it's going to take you a bit to get up to speed, go ahead, you know, take a month or two to do that, that doesn't negate the employee's right to say, no, you should be complying with this right now. That's the law and I'm gonna sue you if you don't. Now, I hope that doesn't happen, but that's something that we have to balance, which is why, again, my advice to you is really keep an eye on that February 19th date. Pay attention to see what the Court of Appeals ruling is. We should hear something end of December, early January, but I think we need to be planning from a budget and from a policy standpoint 
as though this, this is going to happen. Okay. One final note for you. Um, it has to do with dates. The Going Pro Talent Fund, which we've also talked about on prior episodes, this is state-funded dollars that employers can access to help with training programs for their team members. So um, there are two cycles where you can apply for these training dollars, grants of up to $2,000 each, um, in some cases $3,500 each. So these aren't small dollars and they can be available for any of your full-time permanent employees, anyone who's working more than 32 hours a week, and they can be used for training that either leads to a credential, a certificate, certification, academic credit, or a license. So in the age of trying to upskill and reskill our workforces, it's really great if we can have state dollars to help fund those activities. Uh, cycle one funding application deadline is December 15th, so just a few short days from now. Uh, but if, you, if you're missing cycle one, don't worry, there's a cycle two deadline. Um, and that is, let me see here, April 28th of 2023. So if you miss cycle one, don't fret, there's still money left and you could apply for it before April 28th of next year. Um, and then there are dates of when the training has to occur based on that. So, and I'll put more information on Going Pro in the links as well. Just didn't want you to miss out on that. So. With that, what am I at? 11 minutes, 12 minutes? I lie to you every time. I say five to 10 and here I'm at 11. All good information though, folks, all things that you need to be paying attention to. Um, and I'll make sure that there's information to help you along the way. But obviously, if you have questions, you can reach me at Jody Schaefer at Work With HRM. And from Dorothy and Sophia, my golden girls, uh, and from me and my whole team at HRM, we wish you happy holidays, season's greetings, and we'll see you in the new year.